Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ali, and I'm the president of the Computer Science Society here in Nottingham. And I'd like to welcome you all to this talk this evening. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank Dr. Stallman for giving up his time to be here with us this evening. Um, on behalf of the University of Nottingham, the School of Computer Science, and the Computer Science Society, we are all honored to have such a respectable individual within the computer science community at our institution. Uh, so that was a very brief uh, welcome from me, and I'd like to invite up Martin, who will give a more formal introduction uh, to this evening's event. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Are you happy? Are you free? <laughs> well, there's many forms of freedom. Now, we're very honored to have Richard come to talk to us two years ago to a quite an interesting gathering at what's called the Hackspace. Now, and I'm nothing to do with the Hackspace. I'm Martin Lomas, and I head the local GNU Linux users group. And there lies one small part in that we're usually quite lazy in what we call things, and we just use the word Linux. One thing to bear in mind is that when you say Linux, usually you also mean GNU Linux. And here we have the GNU man, who's been, if you like, deeply involved with all things Unixy since the early days, and also with that, the um, freedoms for IT. I can't say anything more. I will hand you over to uh, Dr. Richard Stillman. Is it working? Please raise your hands if you cannot hear me. So, most of the time when people ask me to give a speech, it's because of my work in the free software movement. It's free as in freedom. We're not talking about price. So I started developing the GNU operating system, the idea being make a completely free software operating system, and then we'll be able to have freedom as we use our computers. See, with software, there are just two possibilities. Either the users control the program, or the program controls the users. When the users control the program, we call that free. <clears throat> the way the users control the program is they have four essential freedoms. Freedom zero is to run the program as you wish. Freedom one is to study and change the source code so you can make your copy of the program do your computing the way you wish. Freedom two is to redistribute exact copies, and freedom three is to distribute copies of your modified versions. So this enables users to have both individual and collective control over the program. Individual control means one user makes that program do what the user wants. Collective control means a group of users work together and make a version do what they together decide they want. And we need both because most users don't know how to program. So if you give them just individual control, it isn't enough. Most of them don't know how to make use of that. But collective control means you can be part of a group with other people who want similar things to you, and some of them know how to program, and they can make that version do what's good for all of the you in the group. <clears throat> so there's free software and proprietary user subjugating software where the users don't control the program, so the program controls and subjugates the users. A non-free program generates a system of unjust power because the program controls the users and the owner controls the program, so through it, the owner exercises power over those users. This is why non-free software is an injustice. Non-free software should not exist at all. And our goal is to put an end to it. <clears throat> now that's a distant goal, but a much closer goal is we can escape from non-free software, escape from the injustice. Before we free everyone from that injustice, at least we can free ourselves first. So, in 1983, I started developing the GNU operating system, meant to be a complete free operating system. And in 1992, 
the last piece that was missing got added, and that was a piece called Linux, which is one component of the system as we use it today. So the system is basically GNU and also contains Linux, so we can call it fairly the GNU plus Linux system. But please don't call it Linux, because that's giving the credit for all of our work to somebody who came along later and doesn't share our ideals. Anyway, that's why people started asking me to give speeches. But when, they, when I gave a speech about why software should be free and the, educa and the issues relating to software and freedom, at the end they sometimes asked me, what about other things? Should other things be free also? Well, in the 1980s, I realized that manuals for free software had to be free. And the reason is, a program should come with full documentation, a reference manual, a tutorial introduction, and whatever else is useful. The program should come with it. And when people redistribute the program, they better redistribute the manuals along with the code if they want to be helpful and cooperative. <clears throat> so the manual has to allow redistribution. And when people change the software, the manual might become wrong. So they, if they're conscientious, had better change the manual too. So the manual has to permit modification. In other words, the manual has to come with the same freedoms. Manuals for free software must be free. But does it go beyond that? Essentially, people asked me to consider the question of whether other kinds of published works should be free. Now, if you have something that's not, if you have some kind of work that's not software, well, ex with a few exceptions that are recent, if anything stops you from changing it and redistributing it, it's copyright law. So you can pose the same question coming from the other side, saying, what should copyright law say about what you're allowed to do with published works? The <clears throat> To think about this question, it's useful to look at its context, the history of copyright law, which is also connected with the history of copying technology. <clears throat> Changes in technology don't alter basic moral principles, which are too deep for those technological changes to reach. But when we apply our principles to a practical question, we usually look at the various things we might do in a situation and look at their consequences in order to judge them. So a change in context can alter the likely consequences of the same action and thus make it more good or more bad than it used to be. So it's useful to look at, oh, so for instance, if we could reliably resurrect the dead, then murder wouldn't be so bad. The judge would say, you killed him, you have to pay for his new body, bang. <clears throat> but that's not how things are now. So it's useful to look at the history of copyright law and the history of copying technology to shed light on the issue of copyright today. Copying began in the ancient world. At that time, it was done by reading one copy and writing another. That was very slow copying technology with certain other interesting characteristics. First of all, it had no economy of scale. To make 10 copies would take you about 10 times as long as making one copy. Maybe a little less because you would get more experienced. Second, it required no special equipment other than the equipment for reading and writing. Third, it required no skill other than the skill of reading and writing itself. So it's more or less as fast as anybody else could in the ancient world. The result was a decentralized system of production. Copies of any book were made wherever there was one copy and somebody who wanted to copy it. There was nothing like copyright in the ancient world. If you had a copy and you wanted to make another, nobody said you couldn't do it except perhaps if the local potentate didn't like that book, in which case he might do horrible things to you, which, however, would not copyright, but rather censorship, 
which has been closely linked with copyright ever since copyright first got started. <clears throat> so it went along like this for thousands of years. But then there was a big advance in copying technology, the printing press, which made copying a lot more efficient in a non-uniform way. In the ancient world, mass production copying and one-at-a-time copying were equally inefficient. But with the printing press, mass production copying became a lot more efficient. However, one-at-a-time copying did not benefit at all. In fact, the fastest way to do that was by hand with a, with a pen. <clears throat> You see, the printing press has an economy of scale. It takes a lot of work to set the type, more time than it takes, in fact, to write a copy by hand. But once you have set the type, you can then make many idle copies much faster than you could write them. <clears throat> In addition, the printing press and the type were expensive equipment that most literate people didn't own. They also didn't know how to use those things, because running a printing press is a very different skill from reading and writing. <clears throat> In fact, it's conceivable that someone could run a printing press without really being quite able to write. Uh, I know in the ancient world there were stone carvers who didn't really know how to read and write, and they made mistakes that were ridiculous. If they were literate, they would have seen that those were mistakes. But they didn't notice. In any case, the result of the printing press technology was a centralized system of producing copies of books. Copies of a book were made in a few places, and then they were transported to places where somebody was likely to want to buy them. Copyright began in the age of the printing press. <clears throat> and I believe today's copyright goes back to a, a system established in England in 1553, I believe, by Queen Mary as a system of censorship, censorship of Protestants at the time. <clears throat> so this law said that anyone who wanted to publish a book in England had to get permission from the state. And this permission was granted as a perpetual monopoly to a given publisher. At least it was perpetual in principle, because from time to time, this monopoly would lapse and get restored. However, <clears throat> in the 1680s, there was no desire for censorship anymore, and it was allowed to lapse and stayed <clears throat> lapsed for quite some time. <clears throat> the publishers clamored to get their monopoly back. <clears throat> but what they got in the Statute of Anne was something different. It was copyright as a monopoly for the author for a limited time. <clears throat> I believe it was 14 years, which could be renewed once if the author was still alive. <clears throat> so the idea developed that copyright was <clears throat> a system to encourage writing. <clears throat> When the US Constitution was written, there was a proposal that authors be entitled to a copyright. This was rejected. Instead, the US Constitution makes copyright optional and says that if it exists, it exists for the sake of promoting progress. In other words, the purpose of copyright is to benefit the public, not to benefit the author, let alone the publisher. They don't, they're not specially important whereas the public is. <clears throat> and finally, the US Constitution says the copyright must last a limited time. <clears throat> Ever since then, the publishers have been trying to make us forget and abandon this decision. But in the age of the printing press, copyright was not very controversial. <clears throat> because it operated as an industrial regulation on publishers controlled by authors, but set up so that the system would provide benefits to the public. As a result, it was generally uncontroversial, easy to enforce, and arguably beneficial for the general public. It was 
uncontroversial because it only restricted publishers. So if you had, were not a publisher, you didn't really find it bothering you and you had no reason to complain. It was easy to enforce because it only had to be enforced against publishers, and it's pretty easy to find out who's publishing a given book. You go to a bookstore and you say, where did you get this? It didn't require invading everybody's home, everybody's computer, and everybody's internet connection. And it was arguably beneficial for the public because according to the theory of copyright law, copyright was a bargain, a trade, between the general public and authors. The public traded away part of its natural rights, which didn't, it didn't lose anything by because the public didn't know how to exercise these rights. Natu the natural right was to copy anything you wanted to, but without printing presses, the public didn't have a way to copy. So it didn't lose anything by trading away these rights. And in exchange, it got the benefit <clears throat> of more books written and published, more books you could buy, more conversation about important issues in society. So if you trade something that's of no use for you and you get some benefit in return, it's an advantageous trade. Whether it's the best one you could make, that's another question, but at least it's positive. <clears throat> and if we were still in the age of the printing press, I don't think I would be criticizing copyright. But the age of the printing press is gradually giving way to the age of the computer networks, another advance in copying technology. Digital technology is useful because it facilitates copying, transmitting, and manipulating information. <clears throat> However, as a result of this change, even if copyright law itself had the same text that it had 60 years ago, its effects today would be different. Because today, the publishers want to enforce copyright against the readers and the users of other works. So it is no longer an industrial regulation on publishers, controlled by authors and set up to benefit the public. Now it's an intolerable restriction on the general public, mainly controlled by publishers, and usually only in the name of the authors. But there's an exception for the stars. As a result of this complete change in the effect of copyright law, it is no longer uncontroversial, no longer easy to enforce, and no longer beneficial for the public. It's no longer uncontroversial because it now restricts everybody and in fact, people are forming political parties to fight against this oppression. It's no longer easy to enforce because enforcing it against everybody means invading everybody's home, computer, and internet connection. Consider, for instance, the Digital Economy Act. And it's no longer beneficial for the public because the freedom that governments traded away on our behalf when it was of no value to us because we didn't know how to exercise it, we can now exercise and we want to exercise it. We want to be free to copy. So what would a democratic government do when it hasn't betrayed its people? It would say the freedoms that we traded away on the public's behalf back when that was OK to do, the public now is entitled to, therefore, we're taking them back on behalf of the public. We, it's no longer acceptable to deny people those freedoms. So we will restore people those freedoms. We can measure the lack of democracy around the world by the tendency of governments to do the exact opposite. They're increasing copyright power when they ought to be reducing it. Clearly, they're not working for the people. What are they doing? First, there's a dimension of duration. How long does copyright last? Well, copyright under the statute of Anne lasted 14 or 28 year, years. It's been extended quite a lot since then. And they keep going around extending it. Around the world, there is pressure to make copyright last longer. Copyright in the US has been extended several times in the past 50 years. 
The last time was in 1998 with what we call the Mickey Mouse Copyright Act because Disney was one of the companies that helped purchase that law. That's the way laws are made in the US. Basically, they're for sale by Congress to whoever makes the biggest uh, campaign contributions. <clears throat> A system that's fundamentally corrupt. The US Constitution says that copyright has the last a limited time. The movie companies want perpetual copyright, but they're not strong enough to change copyright law, sorry, to change the Constitution yet. So they came up with a scheme to apparently obey the Constitution while not really, which is called perpetual copyright on the installment plan. Every 20 years, they extend copyright 20 more years. That's their scheme. So in 1998, they extended copyright 20 years on both past and future works. Supposedly, this was going to make more incentive to, to create works. But how could extending copyright on past works make more incentive to make works in the past? They must have a time machine. But the strange thing is, they have neglected to use it because our history books don't say that in 1923, I believe, when authors discovered that they would get a big extension of copyright and that, and even 20 years more, and it would last till 70 years after their death, that they set to work with renewed vigor. Why don't they use their time machine and get us more beloved classics? Theoretically, extending copyright on future works could be more incentive to write and, and make works today, but not for artists that are rational, because the discounted current value of 20 more years of copyright, starting 50 years after your death, is so small that it wouldn't influence any rational person's decision about whether to make a work. And contrary to a certain myth, artists are not generally crazy. They're not so irrational that they would be fooled in that way. No, the real reason for that change in the law was that there were companies like Disney that had lucrative monopolies that were scheduled to expire. They didn't want these monopolies to expire, so they purchased an extension. But I think that any company that wanted to claim it needed more than 75 years of copyright for a work made as, as employees' jobs had a duty to, should have been challenged to show us their projected balance sheets for 75 years in the future to demonstrate their claim. Of course, no company has projected balance sheets 75 years in the future. It was all bullshit. Disney, for instance, knew that the copyright on the first film where Mickey Mouse appeared was going to expire soon, and then everybody would be free to use that particular image of Mickey Mouse in their own works. Well, Disney has got tremendous value from using things from the public domain and knows exactly how important that is, and therefore is absolutely determined never to contribute anything to the public domain. So it bought this law. <clears throat> Unfortunately for the world, this is not limited to the US. Canada was just recently pressured into extending copyright by 20 years. Europe extended copyright on sound recordings a few years ago. They go around the world pushing constantly to extend copyright to make it longer, to make us wait forever, essentially, for things to go into the public domain. The worst case I know of is Mexico, where copyright lasts for 100 years after the author's death. Imagine things that were written before you're born will never go into, cop into the public domain in your lifetime. However, in addition to the dimension of duration, there's also the dimension of breadth. Which uses of a work does copyright cover? In the age of the printing press, copyright was never supposed to cover all uses of a copyrighted work. Of the many possible uses, 
Some, as an exception, were covered by copyright, and the rest people were still free to do. But the publishers see in digital technology the opportunity to seize total control over all use of published works. They want to impose on us a pay-per-view society. And the method that they've chosen is by perverting the technology we use, turning it against us with digital handcuffs, also known as Digital Restrictions Management, DRM. These are the malicious functionalities designed to restrict what users can do with copies of published works. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> implementing these generally involves software. And it's always non-free software. And the reason is, with free software, the users control the program. If the program were designed to restrict them, they could fix it. So anybody whose purpose is to use some software to restrict the users must make sure that the program controls the users and not vice versa. So it's always non-free software. Therefore, this software attacks your freedom at two levels at the same time. First of all, it's non-free software, which is always an attack on your freedom. Second, it has a specific malicious functionality, digital handcuffs. The public saw this first in the area of videos with DVDs, because DVDs were designed with digital handcuffs. They were designed so that the video could be stored in an encrypted format, which was secret, for the sole purpose of restricting the users. The DVD conspiracy said that anyone who wanted to make a DVD player had to join the conspiracy, had to promise to keep the format secret, and promise to build the DVD players to restrict users, just like all the other DVD players, according to the rules of the conspiracy. That's why they all come with the same nasty restrictions. And this scheme worked for a while, but then some people figured out the format and released a free program to, that could play a DVD. So you could actually buy a DVD and play it using only free software. You could also copy the, the video, however, although I don't need those things. This is nice enough. I'm actually happy with it by itself. But it's too hot at the moment, so I've got to do something about that. <clears throat> so, the movie companies didn't like that. So, they purchased a law in the US to make that free software. With the Digital Millennium Copyright Act in 1998, the US imposed censorship on software so that anything that you could use to ban, to, to break digital handcuffs was banned with some limited exceptions. And by doing this, the US government showed it was on the side of the movie companies and other publishers against the people. Well, unfortunately, such laws are not limited to the US. The European Union adopted a similar directive uh, around 2002 and uh, such censorship exists in all the countries of the EU. However, the program remained easy to obtain, so they hadn't actually solved their problem. Therefore, they developed another scheme of encryption, which is called AACS. And the AACS conspiracy is rather powerful and demanding. I looked at their requirements once it was either 2011 or 2013 when they said analog video outputs would be banned because they weren't effective enough for restricting the public. And that scheme is what's used in Blu-ray discs. They thought that that would never be broken, but in fact, 
a, pro, a free program that could decrypt AACS was released. However, the problem is in order to use it, you need to know the key. And they change keys from time to time, and only some of those keys have actually been leaked. So we can't consider the injustice of AACS to be defeated. And it may never be defeated entirely. Meanwhile, Blu-ray discs have another level of digital handcuffs, which they change every three months. Essentially, they have a sort of a standard virtual machine, and then they release various complicated programs to run on it. And these programs do things like check the timing and all sorts of things to try to detect whether it's an imitation. And this is so complicated that the free world hasn't been able to keep up with it. So it's a mistake to assume that the free world will always be so clever that we'll defeat the DRM schemes. Um, so you must regard a Blu-ray disc as something that's incompatible with your freedom. You must not use Blu-ray discs unless, say, the key has been leaked and you can read it with free software. You should never use any device, any product that was made to attack your freedom unless you personally have at hand the means necessary to defeat that attack and repair your freedom. Otherwise, it's the enemy. And the most important thing you can think about in connection with digital technology is to recognize your enemy. But it's getting even worse. There's something called Netflix, which transmits movies over the internet in a secret encrypted format. And if people ever figure out what that is and make some free software, to break these digital handcuffs, it'll not only be censored in quite a few countries, but worse, they would probably just change the scheme of encryption that day. Because after all, they could probably tell people you have to upgrade your client. They probably already had it ready. So don't, under any circumstances, deal with Netflix internet distribution. Now, why have other countries adopted censorship laws like this? Because they're being bullied by powerful countries such as the US and the European Union. And they have governments that have more or less sold out the people already because they want to sign so-called free trade treaties. Now, the idea of the f free trade treaty is to attack democracy because it facilitates companies moving their activities from one country to another. This transfers power from states that in form at least are democratic and could be democratic in practice to companies which don't even pretend to be democratic and which the people can't control except through states. <clears throat> so what do companies do with this power? They make states abandon the people's interests and bow down to companies. Whenever a state is pressured by the people to protect something important like public health or the environment or the general standard of living, companies say, if you try to do that, we'll move production away. And the politicians now have an excuse to tell the people, we can't do this anymore. These treaties say we're not allowed to do our job. Of course, the right's response to that is, break the treaties, restore democracy. The state should carry out its mission, first of all. But they don't, because that's too radical and shocking, and besides, businesses wouldn't like it. <clears throat> so if you look around at any area of life where there are political problems, you'll find that this is what's at work. But the newer free exploitation treaties actually go further, because they create the power for a company 
to sue a government saying, you have laws that are reducing our profits. And this lawsuit goes on in some international institution that's not responsible to the people of any country. And the latest instance has to do with tobacco addiction. A few years ago, Uruguay adopted a law requiring cigarettes to be sold only in plain packages where they just have in a uh, not too large print uh, the name of the company. And one tobacco company whose headquarters are in Switzerland made use of the Switzerland-Uruguay Free Trade Agreement to threaten the government of Uruguay with big damages for protecting public health, and it had to back down. Well, now Australia has adopted a similar law, and the UK is considering one, and both governments and companies are using various free exploitation treaties to attack Australia for this, showing quite clearly that these international institutions, such as the World Trade Organization, exist to kill people on behalf of companies. Um, the people who set up the World Trade Organization and the people who run it now ought to be on trial in The Hague. So among the nasty things that the US imposes in its free exploitation treaties is to have a law to ban anything that enables people to break digital handcuffs. And they've imposed these on uh, New Zealand, on Colombia, on South Korea, and uh, several Central American countries. And they're trying to, of course, you know, the US government is just the tool of big business. And this is what big business tells it to do. <clears throat> so this is what governments are doing. Uh, but we've seen digital handcuffs in other media, not just video. For instance, about 10 years ago, we started to see it in music. Things that looked like compact discs were made, but they weren't written according to the standard specs for compact discs, so we called them corrupt discs. They were a different kind of CD. They were designed so that the tracks were written in squiggly fashion so that they wouldn't read in a computer. And so people made lists of them to warn other people not to buy them. Sony had a very clever idea for how to make corrupt discs. Instead of writing the tracks in a squiggly fashion, they wrote the, the, the music data following the standard, but they put a program on the disc so that if you put the disc into a computer, that program would automatically run, and it would attack the operating system and take control of it and modify it so as to restrict the user's access to all those discs. Now, this, of course, is a grave crime. But that's not all this program did. It also disguised its own presence inside the system and interfered with the command that would normally be used to delete it from the system so that they wouldn't show that it was there and wouldn't delete it. Sounds more and more like a virus, right? It's the same crime as releasing a virus. But that's not the only felony Sony committed. You see, some of the code in this program was copied from a piece of free software that was released under my license, the GNU General Public License. Now, one of the conditions, of the GNU GPL is a particular kind of free license, namely it's a copyleft license, which means that it puts on a condition. Whenever you put some of this text into some other work, that whole work has to be released under the same license. And you must provide people the source code in other words, you must, pr you must pass along the four freedoms with your modified or extended works. Sony didn't do that. That was commercial copyright infringement. And thanks to a law Sony and other such companies purchased in 1996, it's always a felony. Sony was not prosecuted for these felonies. 
because U.S. officials understand that the purpose of laws is to maintain the empire of business over the people. However, pe the victims sued Sony. Unfortunately, they focused their condemnation not on the evil purpose of Sony's actions, but only on the evil methods Sony used. So Sony was able to settle the suit by promising that in the future, when it attacks our freedom, it won't do those other things. And you can see Sony learned its lesson from the PlayStation 3, where the rootkit software to take control of the system is built in before the product is sold. It was designed to be impossible to remove, and it's AACS. And then somebody figured out a way to uh, bypass those restrictions, and Sony attacked all of the users. When the machine was first sold, Sony said, you can run our software and play the games, or you could install some other system on top of some of our software. And you could install GNU slash Linux, for instance, and do whatever you liked. But then, when people found a way to bypass the digital handcuffs, Sony said to every owner of a machine, you're going to have to give up one part of the functionality or the other part. Take your choice. And then somebody found a way to jailbreak the machine, and Sony sent the police after him, which is why we have stickers out there saying, Boycott Sony. A company that acts that way deserves to be destroyed. And if enough of us don't buy from them, we'll destroy them. Anyway, digital handcuffs mostly disappeared in music about five or six years ago. But they're coming back. The companies that distribute found a clever way of, you might say, distracting people's attention from the fact that they're being restricted in this way. Because they say this distribution is streaming. And they want you to imagine that because it's streaming, of course you can't save a copy. But that's ridiculous. That would be the most natural feature to add if the client program were free. The reason the client program is not free, the reason why these services demand that you use a non-free client program is specifically to restrict you. This is a form of digital handcuffs. So that's what Spotify does. Spotify is DRM coming back to music. So join me in saying, out, out, damn Spotify. And don't use something designed to attack your freedom. If you don't have a copy, how could you share one? So these things are, are fundamentally evil. They, they put you at, in a situation of dependence where you didn't have to be dependent on anyone before. And we've also seen digital handcuffs placed on books. Around 13 years ago, there was a big PR campaign to convince people that we were all going to love ebooks. And I have some reason to conclude it was an organized worldwide campaign because I was in an airplane in Brazil and for no particular reason I did something I usually don't do. I pulled out the in-flight magazine and looked at it and where a real journalistic periodical would have an editorial, it had an article speculating about how long it would take before we were all using e-books. Now, they never publish anything unless they're specifically paid to publish that or have a specific financial interest in publishing that. Like, you know, they'll publish stuff about places you might want to go because then maybe you'll fly. That's their interest. But, it, but this wasn't going to convince you to fly anywhere, so they had to be paid to publish it. <clears throat> and then publishers started coming out with e-books, obviously designed with DRM. One publisher had the idea that it could get its line of user restricting ebooks started with a bang among the technophiles if it started with a biography of me. 
Now, this is something that happens often in my life, that people invite me to participate in activities which are exact, which are instances of the evils I campaign about, because they're things that other people use as means to various ends, and they assume that I also will want to use them as means to my ends, except that I regard them as an attack on our freedom, and I won't do them. So I said, I'll cooperate with making this biography if you promise that this ebook people won't be encrypted and people will be allowed to share it. The publisher said no. So I said no. But a few months later, we came, up, came across another publisher that was willing to say yes. Uh, the, a publisher that actually wanted to print the, book, print the book on paper, but also distributed the source under a free license. In fact, you could download it. You could publish your own version. It was published under the GNU free documentation license, which I wrote so that our manuals could all have the same license. In any case, uh, they sold it for some years, and then they stopped. And a couple of years ago, I revised it. I corrected all the errors. But I kept the original author's personal statements of, of point of view, and I kept all his quotes. So now it contains two points of view in contrast. So I call it my semi-autobiography. I don't know if there's any other semi-autobiography like this one. But you can buy it from the Free Software Foundation, or you can download the text. <clears throat> if you want to buy it, that would be at fsf.org. In any case, <clears throat> uh, e-books flopped at the beginning of the 21st century. People just didn't like them. And that was nice, because it meant a threat went away. But I was sure that we hadn't licked them forever. I said, they'll try again. They'll be back. We have to organize now to fight them. And indeed, they've come back with devices like the, uh, well, there's the Schnook and the, uh, there's the Sony Shredder and the Amazon Swindle. I can tell you how the Amazon swindle swindles readers out of the traditional freedoms of readers of books. <clears throat> readers, users of the swindle lose, for instance, the freedom to acquire a book anonymously by paying cash. Amazon doesn't accept payments. There's no way to do that. So users are forced to identify themselves, which means that Amazon maintains a giant database listing every book that each user has read. Now, the existence of such a list is a threat to human rights, especially in a country like this one, where people can be imprisoned for their books. Seriously. In fact, I just read today about somebody who was imprisoned, who was uh, convicted of the crime of having certain books. So that's intolerable by itself, but it's worse. They also take away the freedom to give the book to someone else after you read it, or to lend it to various friends when you wish, or to sell it to a used bookstore. They do this through digital handcuffs and through end user license agreements, which say that users can't own a book anymore. They can only get a license to read the book under Amazon's choice of conditions. <clears throat> so in effect, Amazon says, all of your books are belong to us. And then there's the freedom to keep the book as long as you wish. Amazon abolishes that through a back door in the proprietary software in the swindle. Now, we don't know all the things that this back door can do. But from observation, we know it can be used to remotely delete books. 
because in 2009, Amazon did that. It remotely deleted thousands of copies of a particular book. Copies which until that day were authorized. The users had obtained them directly from Amazon in the approved fashion. They had these authorized copies of the book and then uh, they were suddenly deleted. And I, I met somebody who came to one of my speeches who said that the book had disappeared while he was trying to read it. This was an Orwellian act. And you know what book it was? It was 1984 by George Orwell. So there was a lot of criticism. It made Amazon look bad. So Amazon promised it would never do this again unless ordered to by the state. Which if you've read 1984, <laughs> is not a very comforting promise. 1984 presents a totalitarian state in Britain and the US whose crimes begin with destroying all the books it doesn't like. Why might Amazon be ordered by the state to delete some books? Well, maybe the state says, this book is forbidden. That happens here, you know. Or there are other reasons. Uh, at some point, maybe uh, eight to 10 years ago, I launched a boycott of Harry Potter products. I'll tell you why. It's because the author and publisher got an injunction in Canada ordering the people who had bought one of the Harry Potter books not to read it. Literally. If you want to see all the details, look at stallman.org slash harrypotter.html. Basically, J.K. Rowling really wants money, lots of money. So she makes careful marketing plans to build up hype and then the book goes on sale at a certain date, which has been hyped for a long time in advance. Well, at a bookstore in Canada, they put the books on display for the date they were supposed to be sold. I don't know whose mistake it was. It was the bookstore or the publisher, but in any case, people came in, they saw, oh, wow, it's for sale already, and they bought it, they left. And then somebody noticed that, this, that there had been a mistake. So they stopped selling the books, but Rowling was devastated by the idea that her plan had been messed up by implementing it wrong and that she might not get all the money she wanted to get, she had expected to get from this careful plan. So she went to court and got an injunction ordering those people who had come into the bookstore and bought the book not to read it. Now, we might ask whether it's just that the burden of having failed in carrying out this careful marketing plan should, lead, should, be, should be placed on the people who had perfectly innocently bought a book in a bookstore. Whose fault is it, after all? Who should, who should lose if someone's going to lose? Why should this author and publisher be entitled to repress people that way just to put their own marketing plan back on track if they had messed it up. But that's actually a secondary issue. The main point is it's outrageous to order people not to read a book. So I launched a boycott, but I didn't say don't read Harry Potter books. I leave that to the author. I just say you shouldn't buy, you shouldn't pay for any Harry Potter products. If you want to read the book, borrow someone else's copy. So how does this relate to the swindle? Well, 
Those people bought physical copies of the book. They paid cash and they went away. Rowling couldn't find out who they were. I'm sure she would have loved to find them. She would have sent agents to their houses to take the books away from them, but it was impossible. However, let's imagine that they had been ebooks for the swindle. Then she would have known who they were, and she could have ordered the remote erasure of their copies. So this is a real danger. The official name of that product is the Kindle, which means to start a fire. I think that's meant to hint that the real purpose of that product is virtually burning our books. But they're never going to get my books that way because I'm never going to use a device which does that. <clears throat> so, of course, you shouldn't use the swindle. But we have to fight for books to be, for e-books to be sold in the same way that printed books are sold, respecting all the same freedoms that printed books respect. Take a look at stallman.org slash ebooks.pdf if you want to see the details of this campaign. So we see that in all kinds of media, digital technology is being used to attack our rights. Of course, we have to resist individually by never using any of these products that are designed to attack our rights unless we have the means to protect our rights and defeat that attack. No matter how much you might want to read or listen to one particular thing, reject it if it would take away your freedom. But these schemes are set up by conspiracies of companies in most cases. They organize to attack our freedom. In most cases, it requires a combination of a technology company and publish, or several, and publishers, and so they're working together. How do I know this? They don't hide it. A conspiracy to restrict the public's access to technology ought to be a serious crime, like a conspiracy to fix prices. But it's not. And those companies know that our governments are on their side against the people, so they don't even hide their conspiracies. These conspiracies have websites. That's how I know the rules of the AACS conspiracy. I visited their website. So we have to work together, too. We have to organize. Go to defectivebydesign.org and sign up to participate in our actions. We need to organize to fight ever harder against digital restrictions management. We need to convince companies that they must not do this anymore. So this is what governments are doing and encouraging businesses to do in the field of copyright. But what would a democratic government do? Well, it would reduce copyright power, but how? First, there's a dimension of time. Copyright lasts far too long. It needs to be shorter. I recommend having copyright last for 10 years from the date of publication. Why from the date of publication? Because before the work is published, we don't have copies. So it doesn't matter whether we're, we would copy them or distribute them when we don't have them anyway. We might as well let the author have as long as it takes to arrange for publication and then start the clock. Why 10 years? Because the typical publication cycle is three years. Within three years, a book is typically out of print. So 10 years is more than three times that. It's got to be plenty. Now, I'm not saying 10 years is exactly the right length of time. I have no way of knowing. I'm just being a bit conservative about it. This has got to be plenty. Maybe a shorter period of time might be OK. There are people who want a shorter period of time. Not everybody agrees with me. I once proposed these same things I'm saying now in a panel discussion with fiction writers. And a prize-winning fantasy author said, 10 years, no way. Anything more than five years is intolerable. I was surprised, too. 
Until that moment, I had been fooled by the publishers. Because when the publishers demand more power over us, they always say it's on behalf of the artists. And they may bring out a few stars who say, yes, we want more power over the public. And we're invited to assume that all the artists want more power over the public. But it's not true. You see, the same publishers that talk about the artists and how the artists deserve to have more power over us are, in fact, grinding those artists into the ground with their heels. Except for the stars. They treat the stars very nicely, because the stars have clout. But the other artists don't have clout, so the publishers can knock them around. This writer had won a prize, but his book had not been a bestseller. And it appeared to be out of print, for all his fans could tell, because if they asked the publisher, to, they said, they're saying, I want to buy a copy. Will you sell me one? They never got copies. So his contract had a standard clause saying that if the book went out of print, the rights would revert to him. But the publisher refused to admit it was out of print. The publisher essentially was using the copyright on his own book to stop him from distributing copies, which he wanted to do so that people could read them. He wanted his book to be appreciated, his work to be appreciated. Artists generally start out wanting this. Now, a few of them get a tremendous amount of money and get corrupted in their hearts by that money, like J.K. Rowling. Most of them never get that much money, and they don't have a chance to get corrupted. So they go on wanting people to appreciate their work. He wanted to give his fans copies, by email, I suppose, so they could read his book. And the publisher was using copyright to stop him. Well, he had learned the hard way that more than five years of copyright were not likely to ever do him any good, but could do him harm. Well, I proposed 10 because I'm being a little bit more conservative. But also, f only five years copyright can do harm to free software. So I'm not saying I'm against it, but you've got to do something else as well to prevent it from doing harm to free software. See, the, the thing with software is there are many ways to make a program non-free. Copyright's not the main way. The main way is with end user license agreements and by not letting users get the source code. So if that thing goes into the public domain, all people have got is a binary. They can't, still can't change it. They still can't understand it. And then copyright is another method that's used. And another method that's used is making tyrant devices, which don't allow people to replace the software at all. So even if they get the source code of that program, they still can't change it and actually run the changed version. So our only defense against all those different methods of abuse is based on copyright. It's co it's, the defense is what I explained earlier. It's called copyleft, which is a way of using copyright to defend freedom for all users. Well, when the code goes into the public domain, it's no longer copyrighted, which means copyleft doesn't work either. So if copyright lasts a really short time, copyleft is ineffective. Now, I think 10 years is long enough. A uh, code that's 10 years old isn't going to be doing somebody that much good if he abuses it. But five years is not that long. So I would say if we want copyright to last just five years, we should do something else to avoid for an advantage over free software. See, the problem is if copy, copy left stops working after five years, the proprietary software developers will be able to use our copyleft free code. But we won't be able to use their code because we'll never get it. They only release binaries. So it's a one-sided thing. So I've proposed if we want copyright to last for just five years, we should require the proprietary software developers to put the source code on escrow somewhere so that in five years, their source code will get released when it's in the public domain. And this way, it'll be fair. It'll go both ways. We'll be able to use their code after five years, and they'll be able to use our code after five years. OK. That way, I'd say I'd be content with I could accept five-year copyright. Uh, but I don't propose five-year copyright and this co compensation scheme because I just don't want to be that radical.
but after using 10-year copyright for a while, we could evaluate it. Maybe we would want to make it shorter, maybe a little longer. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not saying 10 years is right. I'm saying it's a good first adjustment. But in addition, there's the dimension width. Which uses of a copyrighted work should copyright cover? For this, I distinguish three categories of works. For instance, well, there's the first category, which is works that are made so that you can use them to do practical jobs. Second, there are the works that present somebody's point of view or thoughts or uh, or experiences. And third, there are works of art and entertainment whose contribution is in the impact that the work makes. These are three different ways that a work contributes to society. And so I reach different conclusions. First, for the works that are made for, to be used to do practical jobs. These include programs, recipes for cooking, educational works, reference works, fonts for displaying paragraphs of text, and some other kinds of things as well. These works should all be free. And the reason is the people who are using the works deserve to have control over their lives. That's what freedom is having control over your life. And if you're doing a job with one of these works, you deserve to have control over the job you're doing, which means you have to have control over the work. And you're led to a requirement for the same four freedoms, because those four freedoms are what allow the users of the work to have both individual and collective control over the work they're using. <clears throat> now, we can see that there are, people are doing substantial amounts of work on free works in these areas. There are even some free textbooks and some free online educational resources. Unfortunately, in the field of educational resources, the world is making a big mistake right now. Because most of the publishers of online educational resources are using the term open rather than free. Now, this started in the field of software. In 1998, there were people who didn't like using the word, they coined another term, open source which was meant to be equivalent to free software. Although when they gave it a precise definition, it, it's written very differently, and they ended up drawing the line at a slightly different place. So there are some programs which are open source, but not free. Fortunately, they're not used very much. So for the most part in practice, the two terms are, are almost equivalent. But in education, they're tremendously different. In fact, almost all the educational works that they call open are non-free. They're under a license that's too restrictive. If you want to read more about this problem, look at stallman.org slash articles slash online dash education dot html. They're using the Creative Commons non-commercial share-alike license. Share-alike means it's a kind of copy left. But because it's non-commercial, it isn't free. A work that's free means you can use it for any purpose, including business. And one unfortunate thing about this license is as people make, as more people make modified or combined versions of works under that license, you end up with a work with uh, maybe hundreds or thousands of contributors, and it would be completely infeasible for anyone to get permission to use that work commercially. There would be no way to find decades worth of contributors to ask them permission. You know, if a, work is, if a work is written by one person and that person publishes it, well, you could go to that under a license that doesn't permit commercial use and you want to make commercial use, you can ask for permission. But if there are hundreds of authors over a period of decades, you can't find them. So in effect, these works are orphaned before they're born. So this is something we need to campaign to change. We've got to insist on making free educational works. 
and some people are doing so. It's just unfortunate that high profile organizations are going in, in the wrong direction. Anyway, next there's the category of works that present certain people's point of view or thoughts or experiences. This is a totally different issue because these works are not meant to be used to do a practical job. They meant, they're meant to show you something, of ideas that certain people had. Well, that means that there's no particular reason why just anybody should be allowed to publish a modified version of that. And that means there's no particular reason why people should be allowed to commercially republish it either. But there is something that people must be free to do, and that's share. When I say sharing in the context of published works, I mean non-commercial redistribution of exact copies. Sharing must be legal. So what I recommend for these works is a somewhat modified copyright system where all commercial use and all modification is still covered by copyright as today. But non-commercial redistribution of exact copies is simply legal and can't be interfered. That that's, should be a human right to share copies of any published work. <clears throat> and so this system will continue to provide income to the authors in more or less the same inadequate, lousy way as today. And then there are also works of art and entertainment. For those, modification was a difficult issue for me to resolve because I saw valid arguments on both sides. On one hand, a work can have an artistic integrity and modifying it could destroy that integrity. You can see that this is true by comparing many books with the movies that are made from them. Hollywood systematically destroys artistic integrity with the permission, generally, of the authors. But there are some writers that don't permit this to happen who apparently really have artistic integrity. On the other hand, modifying artistic works can be a contribution to art. Consider, for instance, the folk process, by which a series of artists can transform work and sometimes produce something very rich. And if we want to consider known named authors, consider Shakespeare. Some of Shakespeare's plays used stories copied from other works that had been published a few decades before. If today's copyright law had been in effect then, those works would have been infringing. They wouldn't have been written, of course, because uh, the author, whoever it actually was, decided it would have considered it useless to write something that couldn't have been published or, or staged. And of course, the copyright holders would have said, it's a good thing he's not allowed to make this ripoff, because it would just be a cheap ripoff of my great work. Now, since in fact they were written, we can say that they were significant contributions to human literature. But that's only because they were written. So when the copyright holders have the power to prevent such works and use it, and then they say they'd be ripoffs, we therefore systematically don't have any way to judge whether that's true. Well, after a while I realized that Although a modified version of an artistic work can be a contribution to art, it's generally not urgent. If you had to wait up to 10 years for the previous artistic work to go into the public domain before you were allowed to publish your modified version, you could wait 10 years. With today's copyright, you can't wait that long. You can't wait till 70 years after the other artist died. You might be dead then too. But 10 years in general, you could wait. And it's only a maximum of 10 years that you'd have to wait. Because presumably the work had already been published for some time before you made your modified version. You might only have to wait five years. So what I propose is, for, five, for, for 10 years, this somewhat reduced copyright system that covers commercial use and modification, 
but everyone's free to non-commercially redistribute exact copies, which is sharing. So we have to legalize sharing, and that includes both private sharing and public sharing on the internet. Peer-to-peer -peer sharing on the net should be legal. Whether something like mega upload is legal, I don't think it's a very important question. Because after all, mega upload was a business, but people were using it non-commercially. But if peer-to-peer -peer sharing is legal, people wouldn't need a mega upload. So that's why I don't think it's very important exactly where that line gets drawn. You know, if they draw it in a place that permits mega upload, that's nice. If they draw it in a place that prohibits mega upload, what well, still still gives us the freedom we really need? <clears throat> Now, another thing that has to be done in regard to copyright is to permit remix somehow. So remix means taking pieces out of various works and putting them together in a work that's totally different in spirit. Uh, so it's in no way a substitute. It's different from a modified version. A modified version of a work could mean something that's basically the same work, but part of it's different. With Remix, you're making something very different, so it's fundamentally different. Now, we've got to be careful to make sure that if some of the old or earlier works are copyleft, that the remixed work is still copyleft. We don't want Remix to be an excuse to destroy copyleft. But people have to be allowed to do the remixing. Now, the publishers have been waging for decades a war on sharing. They started with propaganda. They called people share pirates, which is ridiculous. Piracy means attacking ships, and that's very bad. Sharing is good. So to equate the two is morally perverse. We should not refer to sharing by the same word we use for attacking ships. So when people ask me what I think of piracy, I say attacking ships is very bad. I'm completely against it. I hope the Navy catches all the pirates and puts them in prison. But that has nothing to do with sharing copies. Well, if they had limited themselves to propaganda, it wouldn't be a war. They have a right to express their views. But they didn't stop with that. They started perverting our technology, turning it against us with digital restrictions management. And that should be illegal. But they didn't stop there, because then they started buying laws to ban us from defending ourselves from these digital handcuffs. Explicitly unjust laws, laws which actually say the only way that uh, something that can that can break digital handcuffs can be legal is if it has some other commercially significant use. So this, this law is explicitly saying only commercial significance matters. Does it have another use that's significant for our freedom, significant culturally? Those don't matter. No, only commercial interest matters. So this is explicitly oppressive, as well as oppressive in its effect. But they didn't stop there, because then when people started developing peer-to-peer -peer sharing networks, they started to attack those, too, uh, with starting in France with the law that people would, that abolishes the basic principle of justice, no punishment without a fair trial. Well, the Digital Economy Act is exactly that, punishment without a trial. People are accused of sharing, and they're punished. Uh, this is the clear sign of a government that is against the people. Of course, punishment on mere suspicion is a standard thing in the UK. The UK has a law which makes it an offense to possess anything that creates a reasonable suspicion it might be intended for committing some act of terrorism. So this is the excuse for punishing people for mere suspicion, mere accusation. 
defining the existence of the suspicion as the offense. Isn't this clever? But it doesn't change anything. This is imprisonment on suspicion. It's tyranny. But they didn't stop there. Um, they also, in many countries, have laws that allow websites to be shut without a trial because they're accused of sharing. Now, it used to be they had to look for other excuses to impose censorship on the net. For instance, uh, it's a representative of, I looked it up, it's the IFPI, which is an organization of record companies, uh, who said at a meeting that he was really excited by the idea of measures to shut down websites that were accused of spreading what they call child pornography, although the term is a lie. In, in the US, 17-year-olds are called children in this regard, even though most 17-year-olds are sexually active. So, uh, but the, he said, we really love child pornography as an excuse for shutting websites, because then we could extend it to the websites we really want to shut. So, the wedge. We have their word that it's intended as the edge of the wedge. But nowadays, they become bolder, and they explicitly say they want to shut websites or filter and block access to websites because they're being used for sharing. And we see this spreading to many countries, too. Of course, these laws have to be eliminated. But they're going even further. In Japan, downloading an unauthorized copy years in prison. And if that doesn't get people to stop, I suppose they'll start shooting them. Because these companies want money, they want lots of money, and they don't care what they have to crush to get it. They are your enemy. Now, they protest that if we share, they won't get what they deserve. Well, I disagree. They'll get exactly what they deserve. The, and that not only that, another, I forgot to mention another thing they did. They sued thousands of teenagers for hundreds of thousands of dollars. For those lawsuits and for lobbying for these unjust laws, what those companies deserve is to be wiped out. They deserve to cease to exist. They shouldn't even go bankrupt. They should be dissolved. So, of course, we should give those companies everything they deserve. But they always say that they're doing it for the artists. They say if you share music that you're stealing from your musicians. That's ridiculous. The record companies steal from the musicians. They don't leave anything we could steal. Even if we wanted to, there's, the musicians don't get anything from the copyright system except for a few stars. And it's not even all the stars. It's just the long established stars. And the reason is the first contract that the musicians get with a record company exploits them horribly. Theoretically, there's a certain fraction of the price you pay which goes to the musicians. But in practice, they never get it. Because the contract treats the publicity and production expenses as an advance to them, although musicians don't actually ever get it. And so when you buy some, something, that fraction that's supposedly for the musicians actually goes to another account in the record company to, quote, repay, unquote, the quote, advance, unquote. So, oh, and the record companies used to not even give the musicians an honest accounting of how many copies they'd made. They used to make and sell lots of copies and pretend they didn't exist. So, when I buy a commercial CD, I feel ashamed to know I'm not supporting the musicians. <clears throat> So this doesn't mean that musicians get no benefit from having a record contract. How do musicians actually make money if they're not stars? Uh, well, they s sell tickets for their concerts. They sell merchandise at their concerts. Well, I'm nothing against that. I'm not proposing to change any of that. 
Uh, so through their record contracts, through the publicity that's done, if they get to be successful, then they have more concerts, more people come, they can charge more. Well, okay, but there are other ways to give publicity to musicians. For instance, by mailing a copy to your, of a track to your friends. So let's get the record companies out of the, out of the whole area. Let's put an end to the hype industrial complex. Let's close the music factories, which take truckloads of money and squeeze it into something and call it music. It'll be healthier for music. Now, why do the stars actually make money from the system? Well, if music becomes so popular with their stars, eventually they come to the end of their first contract and being stars, they have clout, so they can negotiate a, another contract which doesn't exploit them. And then, in that contract, they'll really get money when, they, when their records are sold. But that only applies to the records under the other contract. The ones that, the, the earlier ones, five or seven albums typically under the first contract, oh, they never get uh, any money from those. I've read how it's common for a record to go platinum and not start to give any money to the musicians. So I see nothing at all wrong in being a record company. I buy records. I'd like there to be record companies. And if we had a copyright system that required record companies to actually pay musicians, it might be a good thing. But the major record companies, every year there are fewer of them, I don't know how many there are now, uh, which lobbied for unjust laws and sued thousands of teenagers. They deserve to be wiped out. Let's have other record companies. And what about movies? Well, you've heard astronomical sums for the cost of making a movie. A producer told me that those sums are fictitious. That more than half is not making the movie, it's publicity. And of the less than half that was actually making the movie, that's exaggerated too using creative accounting. So it really costs a lot less than what we're told. You put that together with the fact that a lot of use of movies is commercial use and would be covered by my proposed somewhat reduced copyright system just as it is now and you see that they'll still get money, they could still make movies. But suppose they had some, some, some difficulties. Suppose they couldn't quite make so many. Well, would that be a tragedy? Hollywood systematically makes trash. Now, I didn't say Hollywood usually makes trash, although that's true also. I said something stronger. Hollywood systematically makes trash. There is a system at work, and I learned about the functioning of the system from a book called Save the Cat. The purpose stated for the book was to teach people how to write screenplays and sell them to Hollywood. I wasn't interested in trying to do that, but what I learned about from what I learned from the book is how the system works that assures that almost everything Hollywood makes is crap. Now, this does not mean I don't think they should be allowed to make such movies. I'm against censorship of anything. But, what it, but that's not the question. You know, nobody's proposing they shouldn't be allowed to make crap. The question is, should we give up our freedom to help them make more crap? And that I'm against. Actually, someone is proposing massive censorship. The European Union is considering a directive to ban porn which would be extremely massive censorship. I hope that that gets blocked. But in any case, the existing copyright system does a bad job of supporting artists. Now, I don't propose to stop people from selling copies. I don't propose to stop people from s selling tickets to performances. I see nothing wrong with those practices. Why change them? But 
we might want to support artists better than the existing system. So I propose two additional ways to support artists that we could adopt on top of selling copies and supporting artists that way. One method uses, works through the government. The government would distribute funds directly to artists based on their popularity. How would it get these funds? Well, they could come from the general budget. They could come from a special tax on internet connectivity. It doesn't matter so much precisely how they, get, how they would get the money because it would be much less money than we're paying now. So whatever method they use, we'd be better off. The crucial thing is how to distribute the money. First of all, don't give it to publishers. Give it to the artists. But in that way, we could, the money would go a lot further. Yeah, it's important at the goal of supporting artists. But the next thing is, how do you just divide it among the artists? Well, the existing system supposedly supports them based on their popularity. My proposal keeps that. It also is based on our popularity, except we have to measure it. We can measure it. Of course, we should not measure it by surveillance of everybody. We could do it by polling, surveys, by measuring how much peer-to-peer -peer sharing is going on. But once you've got a popularity figure for each artist, how much money does that artist get? The obvious way, the way that's been proposed, for instance, in France, in the parliament, was in linear proportion to popularity. Well, that's obvious, but it doesn't give very good results. The problem is a star can be a lot more popular than a good and fairly successful artist. If A, the star, is a thousand times as popular as B, the appreciated, fairly successful artist, with linear proportion, A would get a thousand times as much money as B. Well, that's not a very useful outcome. That means in order for B to get enough money for the expenses of life, in order not to need to have a day job, we would have to make A tremendously rich, and most of the money would go to the stars who don't really need any more. So this would just be another way to enrich the rich without doing much good for the arts. To fix this, I propose we take the cube route. Take the cube root of each artist's popularity, which has the effect of transferring most of the money from the stars to the artists of medium popularity. So if A is a thousand times as popular as B, well, the cube root of a thousand is 10. So with the cube root, A would get 10 times as much money as B, not a thousand, just 10. So with the cube root, it remains the case that the more popular you are, the more money you get. But it's a sliding scale, you might say. Uh, your, your income rises fairly fast, but then it rises more slowly as you gain more popularity. So the effect is most of the money would go to the mid-range popularity artists, artists that nobody likes still would get nothing. And yes, each star would get more than a fairly successful artist, but not enormously more. So we wouldn't be giving most of the money to stars. Most of the money would be going where it's needed to the artists who really need more support in order to be full-time artists. Uh, with these two improvements in efficiency, we could support artists much better with much less money. The other method uses voluntary payments. I don't call them micropayments because they're not that tiny. They're, you might call them mini payments. The idea is, that we give every player a button. And if you push the button, it sends a certain sum of money to the artist who made that work, what the last work played. And you can push it if you wish. And if you don't, there's no pressure. You're not punished. You're not harangued. But if you do push it, you'll feel good. <laughs> it feels good to help the artist who made something that you appreciated. So the idea is to choose a sum of money which is not too small, because if it's really small, lots of people could send this amount of money and it wouldn't amount to much, but isn't too big, because if it were too big, people would hesitate to send it. So I'm thinking 20p or 50p might be a good amount in the UK. But each country would choose this amount in order to try to maximize the total people send in any given period of time. 
So I, I figure the total, if this is the, the amount each that's sent, the total would probably look like this. There'd be some peak. If you estimate where that is, you do the best job supporting the artists. Now, most of you, I think, could push the button to send 20p every day without feeling that you're losing money you can't afford to lose. But there are people who can't send 20p, like the people who are unemployed or and are about to get their benefits cut uh, and are forced to move hundreds of miles to a place where they can find a smaller apartment, the people who are unable to work but some private company is telling them that they're actually fit. You know, the poor people can't and won't send this money, and they shouldn't have to. We don't need to squeeze money out of the poor to support artists. There are enough non-poor people who will be happy to support artists. And if we'd like them to send a bit more, we could have kind, friendly public relations campaigns. Did you send a little money to some artist today? Try it. You'll be amazed at how good you feel after you do. Come on, push the button. Contrast that with the mean-spirited publicity campaigns of the war on sharing that tell you if you share and help other people, then you're a pirate, you're a thief, you're a counterfeiter. <clears throat> now, I should explain that it's no surprise that the war on sharing uses a series of draconian nasty measures. You see, sharing is good, and with digital technology, sharing is easy. So of course people share. What could possibly stop them from sharing? Only nastiness. So let's get rid of the nastiness. Let's support artists better in ways that are fully compatible with encouraging people to share. If we adopt either of these systems, and by the way, there are many ways to combine aspects from the two systems, many variations can be made, then artists will say, please share my work. They'll be happy that people are sharing their work which is, of course, the initial feeling of any artist to see, oh, people appreciate me. The existing system and its scheme for paying artists the fraction that do get paid uh, mostly per perverts their wish to be appreciated. Oh, and by the way, there are some kinds of artists for which uh, copying is not the way that their art is distributed, like painters and sculptors. They may, not, they may only make one. Well, I'm not trying to say that should be changed, but w this whole topic may not apply to, to them if, they, if, they're only, if, they're not, if their works are not being copied and are not f easy to copy. Okay, well, I'm not saying that what I'm saying has to apply to everything and everyone, but there are areas where it does apply. So, uh, if you want more information about free software, look at GNU.org. For the Free Software Foundation, look at FSF.org. Now, I'm a volunteer for the FSF, but it has a paid staff, and we need to get money to pay them. If you buy the merchandise downstairs, by the way, is somebody guarding that merchandise or someone put it away? Good, thank you. And, uh, but you'll go back there to, to sell it now, right? People will go back there and sell more now that you're starting to leave? Good. Uh, that money goes to the Free Software Foundation. You can also give a donation. You can also join. You can do it through fsf.org. You can also pay your dues in cash right here if you wish. There's also the Free Software Foundation Europe. At fsfe.org, you can join that too. Meanwhile, right now, I'm going to auction this adorable GNU that needs a home on, for the benefit of the Free Software Foundation. If you buy it, I'll be happy to sign the card for you. And if you have a penguin at home, you must get a GNU for your penguin, because as we all know, a penguin can't hardly function without a GNU. We can accept payment either in cash or using a credit card. 
if the credit card can make international purchases by phone to work with us. When you bid, please wave your arm and shout the amount because you want me to hear you and I have some hearing problems. I'm going to move over here to reduce the angle to see all of you with. Uh, and I'm going to start with approximately its usual price, which is 20 pounds. Uh, do I get 20 pounds? How much? 20. I've got 20. Do I get 25? 25. I've got 25. Do I get 30? Yeah. How, how much? 30. I've got 30. Do I get 35? <laughs> I've got 30. Do I get 35? I've got 30, do I get, how much? 35? How, I've got 35, do I get 40? I've got 35, do I get 40 or more? 40 or more for this adorable gadoo that needs a home. Do I get 40 or more to the Free Software Foundation to defend freedom? 40 or more to the Free Software Foundation? How much? I've got 40, do I get 45? I've got 40, do I get 45? 45 or more to the Free Software Foundation to defend for, to this, for this adorable GNU. I've got 45, do I get 50? I've got 45, do I get 50? 50 for this adorable GNU. 50 to the Free Software Foundation to defend freedom. Last chance to bid 50 or more. How much? I've got 50, do I get 55? I've got 50, do I get 55? Do I get 55 or more to the Free Software Foundation for this adorable GNU? Last chance to bid 55 or more. Last chance, going, going, gone for 50. Please come up and pay. So how do you wish to pay? Uh, I'll come credit card. Well, in that case, you should write all the data on a piece of paper. I have a piece of paper if you need. Uh, and your name, of course, and, the, uh, and some, a phone number or email address okay. and the price. And then bring them both to me. So now it's time for questions. By the way, if there's an ATM somewhere near here, you'll have time to go to it and get money out, if that's easier. Yeah, ask. I can't hear you at all. What? I'm afraid I can't hear what he is saying. I have hearing trouble. Oh, she's going to change, she's going to change the tape, I think. Uh. Oh good, the merchandise is now up here. Everybody is disappearing. By the way, uh, if you could check whether any of the stickers have run out and put out more of those because there are some more stickers in that box for some kinds. And uh, with people leaving, it's good if they can take all the kinds of stickers. OK. okay. So the question was, what about patents? I'd rather not talk about patents than talk about copyright, because patents and copyright have nothing to do with each other. There are different laws that work totally differently and have different effects. Uh, so I would recommend that you look at gnu.org slash philosophy in there. There are some articles about patents. And in addition, Wired published my recommended solution for the problem of software patents in November. The Guardian published my article about the danger of the EU Europe 
sorry, unitary patent. Uh, so that, that was last year, I believe. Uh, so take a look for that. You'll find a lot of people who confusedly lump together copyright law and patent law and several other unrelated, totally different laws and call this mishmash, quote, intellectual property, unquote. Every time that term is used, it's spreading confusion. Even experts who know what each of those laws does tend to make errors when they use that general term in a sentence because it basically pushes people to generalize about things that are not actually similar. So you have to work very hard to make a general statement using that term that isn't false. And it's a mistake to even try. The way to understand each of these laws is one by one. Yes, I can when you speak carefully. Okay, uh, Oracle lost that case, uh, which is a good thing, because they were trying to claim a copyright basically on the interface definition files. But note that Oracle released, well, so it was Sun that did this, but Oracle bought it, released an implementation of Java as free software. We can use that, but that program copy left it. And Google wrote a different implementation of Java, so it would not be copy lefted. So it wouldn't, even if, of course, if Oracle had won that case, the general decision would be a disaster. But it wouldn't be a disaster particularly for Java. It would be a disaster for everything else. So it's extremely important for Oracle's claim to fail, but not particularly because of Java. Oh, well, the, actually, that's a confusing thing. The term web application is a generalization about two very different things. First of all, there are programs written in JavaScript that get sent to the user's computer to run there. Well, that's OK as long as it's free software. If it's non-free software, which it usually is, then you shouldn't run it, because you should never run a non-free program. That's software that ha ex gives someone else power over you. Then there is software that runs in somebody else's server. Now, I hope for his sake that it's free software, but that doesn't directly affect you as a user of that service. However, there are unethical things that the service can do. They're different, though, because a service is not a program. A program is something you can get a copy of. It's a kind of work. A service is not a work. A service is an activity. So it's a totally different kind of issue. If someone offers a service, well, it may be ethical or not, but it isn't a matter of whether you can get a copy of the service. That's a meaningless thing to ask when it's a service. So what bad things can a service do? Well, it can do surveillance, and many of them do a lot of surveillance. That's nasty. Uh, in fact, you can almost expect commercial web services do surveillance be very, very uh, cautious about using any of them for that reason. And then, of course, they, they ask you to give them data. In some cases, for good reason, because they couldn't possibly do what you want without some data. But they're likely to misuse that data, too, which means you should hesitate to let them have any of it. Then there's another thing that they can do that's bad, and that is some of them are software as a service. Now, you'll notice that there's some red buttons over there that say, don't SAS me. SAS is software as a service. Well, software as a service means that your own computing, the stuff that you could do in your computer with the right program, these services offer to do it for you. They basically say that they want you to entrust to them your own computing. But that means you lose control over it. How can you have control over your own computer to do it with a free program, your own copy of a free program, and then you have control over that? Otherwise, you lose control over your computing, and that's an abuse. 
So these are the ways that a service can be bad. So if we want to understand how these issues apply to any given web service, we should reject the conceptualization of a web app that's meant to get us to ignore the difference between software sent to the client to run in your own machine and the software that runs in the server itself. They raise different issues. So we must not lump them together. Oh, and if you want to protect yourself from non-free JavaScript programs, use the LibreJS program, which is an add-on for Firefox that checks all JavaScript software for carrying a free license. Okay, well, first of all, the bad thing about TVOization is that it doesn't violate GPL version 2. Right, because when I wrote GPL version 2 in 1991, I didn't anticipate the danger of TVOization. I didn't in anticipate that they, they would do it. But what happened was the company TiVo was using a GPL covered program, namely Linux, and somebody complained to them that they were violating the license by not releasing the source code. So they started releasing the source code. But then they made the next version of the product so that if users installed a modified version of that program, it wouldn't run at all. So after some years of thinking about this, I came to the conclusion that this made the executable non-free, that the user lost freedom one this way. Now, this is an interesting issue because, you know, 20 years ago, we didn't think about it at all. My first thought about it was, well, the, you get the source code. The source code is free. You could install that program somewhere else in a modified version. But on that it, more, I came to the conclusion that this is trampling the user's freedom, that that executable has been made non-free, and that shouldn't be allowed. So in GPL version 3, it's not allowed. GPL version 3 says that they have to give you the installation information, which is how to put your own modified version of that program into the computer that you own so that it will actually run successfully and can do its job. But Torvalds didn't take the step with me. So he continues to regard TVOization as OK. And that's why he didn't try to move Linux to GPL version 3. He keeps Linux under GPL version 2 because he wants to allow TVOization, which means allow users not to have freedom, because he never agreed with the free software movement at all. But with TVOization generally, there's lots of other license violations as well. Well, I don't know about that. Well, if they do that, please tell the copyright holders. The copyright holders are the ones who can enforce the GPL. Now, in the GNU project, we ask people to assign copyright to the Free Software Foundation. We don't insist, but we basically we tell the developers of each package, if you wish, you can make it an FSF copyrighted package, and then we'll enforce the GPL for you. But in where developers have kept their own copyrights, then we can't enforce, but they can. So when, if you see an instance of this, tell the developers. With the way copyright law works, they could ban the import of the product. Well, yeah, if, of, I, hope that, I hope that that of course, requires a court to give an injunction. Uh, it shouldn't be done uh, administratively. But yes, uh, that can, copyright can be enforced. But you've got to tell the copyright holders because those are the ones who can enforce. Another question. I have a number of free software. I can't quite hear your speech sounds. I have seen a number of free software programs that originally started as being marketed on GPL. Uh, but later on, they either changed or discussed the change to no copyright license, such as MIT license or. Actually, MIT license is ambiguous. You shouldn't use that term. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think in most once in a while there is a good reason to do that, but usually the reasons proposed are foolish ones. Okay, but do you, do you consider a threat to the free software movement if this would become a threat? 
Yes, it would be. It would harm our defense of our freedom. That's why I think it's a foolish. Now, once in a while, there's a good reason to do that. I'll give you an example. The code that implements playing AUG format was originally copy lefted. But the developers said that they thought it would be good to make it non copy lefted because they wanted to encourage people to make products that could play AUG. Even if the products were otherwise not free software, it was important for our freedom to make AUG format work. So essentially, it turned out to be strategically good to make a tactical rec retreat on one particular front. And I said that I thought it was a good idea, and they did it. The thing is, when people use, when people look at doing this for other reasons, and they're not looking at the long-term defense of our freedom as the goal, then they're likely to make a retreat be just because the enemy's pushing on them. Or someone says, hey, release your code under a lax permissive license and leave the users defenseless, and we'll use your code. Won't that please your ego to have us using your code? It shouldn't. We have to recognize that if somebody uses our code, that's his gain, and if he doesn't use it, that's his loss. So uh, the other thing is, they'll say, oh, well, if, we, if you change to a last license and leave the users defenseless and let us make your code proprietary, in the pro we'll do some improvements in it. Well, theoretically, it's possible, but usually, they, usually it's an empty promise. People like that, they don't end up doing the improvements that you hoped. I've seen this happen. I can't hear any of the sounds you are saying. Well, hacking is playful cleverness. And I generally appreciate playful cleverness, although in this, as in any, act, any other activity, there are ways to be ethical or unethical. I won't say that all playful cleverness is necessarily good. But in general, you know, if it's not hurting people, I like it. Cracking is a different thing. Cracking means breaking some kind of computer security. Is that good or is that bad? It depends. It depends what someone's doing. I used to say that uh, I thought it was right for banks to have security on their computers because I wouldn't want people to digitally rob banks. But then I saw that the banks were robbing all of us. So now I'm not sure I want to use that example anymore. I still think it's bad to get credit people's credit cards out of websites and release them. That's hurting people. Well, actually, no, the confusion about the meaning of open source comes from those two words. Most people misunderstand the term. You see, the people in 1998 started using the term open source. They wanted to define it as more or less the same criterion as free software. They just didn't want to use those words. And they wanted to forget about our ethical approach to the issue. They wanted to present it purely as a practical convenience matter. They don't cite freedom and community as values. They cite code quality as a value. But they did want it in practice to be basically the same category of software. However, Almost everyone misunderstands it tremendously, because when you look at those words, it sounds like they mean you can look at the source. So they th people think that open source means you can see the source code and nothing more. So if, you can, if someone will show you the source code, but you're not allowed to change it, not allowed to redistribute it, they think that that's open source. According to the people who, who started open source, it's not. They picked a criterion which in practice is almost equivalent to our criterion for free software. So this is a big misunderstanding, and the reason is the misunderstanding is the natural meaning of those words. 
So they have to constantly struggle to stop people from interpreting those words according to their natural meaning. Whereas we have a somewhat lesser problem. We have a term free that has two normal meanings, and we have to tell people which meaning is the one we intend. So it's free as in freedom, free as in free speech, not as in free beer. But once you know which of the two normal meanings is the right one, you will understand it. They have a harder problem because there's only one normal meaning and it's not what they mean. So they have to tell people, ignore the normal meaning, the apparent meaning of those words, here's what it means. And they're not getting very far at it. I try to help them on that because you know, it's bad enough if people say open source instead of free software, but if they say open source and they misunderstand it, that's even worse. But I often will say the French or Spanish word uh, libre or libre uh, because that's unambiguous. And you'll notice that increasingly free programs will have that word in their name as a way of saying this program is there for your freedom. Well, I would call it free hardware. I don't like to use the word open at all in connection with these issues because I want people to think about freedom, not mere openness. But if we call that free hardware, it's the same definition basically, uh, well, I think we don't need to insist on that now. And the reason is we can't make the hardware ourselves. Now, free 3D printers are in their infancy. And there's very little you can see in this room that we use that we could make with today's 3D printers. Maybe in 50 years we could make all of it. If that happens, we will need to demand free files to make the objects. Because the file that controls making a useful object with a 3D printer is in the first category. It's a work that's meant for, made for people to do practical jobs with, so it's got to be free. But if the hardware can only be made in factory, it's not a crucial issue for us whether we have the plans of it. We couldn't use it any plans anyway. So who cares if we've got them? Practically speaking, today it's not crucial. As I said, changes in technology can change the conclusions about these issues. I don't try to deal with tomorrow's problems today using today's technology, especially if the problems come from hypothetical tomorrow's technology. Let's leave them for tomorrow, and we can address them with tomorrow's technology. If we try to address them today with today's technology, we're solving a problem that will never actually have to be solved. What we need today is not free hardware, but rather documented hardware. We need hardware whose specs are not secret, because that means we can write free software to run it. And this is a big challenge. In various areas, it's hard to find any hardware that's documented. And we need to do reverse engineering. If you want to make a big and important contribution to the free world of a technical nature, do reverse engineering. In fsf.org slash campaigns, you'll find a link to our reverse engineering project task list. Okay, with that, I think, can we thank Dr. Dillon? And there's merchandise on the table down here. Lots of GNU's. Well, there's only one GNU, but. Lots of GNU's. Well, actually, yeah, lots of pictures of GNU's. So, would the purchaser of the GNU please bring up the data? I've got